Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 299 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the chronovisor. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1972, the Italian public was shocked when the respected newspaper, La Domenica del Corriere, or the Sunday Courier, carried a story announcing the invention of a time machine. This machine had been invented by a Benedictine monk named Father Pellegrino Ernetti and a team of scientists. Known as the chronovisor, it allowed one to view any point in the history of the world. And to prove it, the paper carried a photograph of the face of Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. What should we make of this story? Was the chronovisor real? And if so... Who has it now? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Now, Jimmy, this isn't the first time that we've mentioned the chronovisor on the program, is it? No, we actually mentioned it way back in episode 147 on the Vatican Secret Archives. In uh, that episode, we read a list of 10 things that the Vatican is rumored to have in the secret archives, now known as the Vatican Apostolic Archives, and one of them was the chronovisor. As you said, it's a machine that reportedly lets you view moments in the past, like Doctor Who's space-time visualizer from the TV story The Chase. But it's basically a time television that would let you see and hear what people did in the past. At the time, I dismissed the idea that it was in the Vatican Secret Archives for two reasons. First, because the Secret Archives is an archive for documents. It's basically a library, and thus not the place for storing inventions. And secondly, because I found the whole story so implausible that I never entertained the possibility that the chronovisor might be real. I thought it was just a crazy internet rumor. However, it has come to my attention that it isn't simply a crazy internet rumor. It actually predates the era of the internet, and there's more to the story of the chronovisor than I was aware of, so that's why we're discussing it today. Let's start by looking at the newspaper that announced it to the public, Italy's Sunday Courier. What kind of newspaper is this? How credible is it? Is it just a tabloid paper, or... Italy's version of the former American comedy parody newspaper, The Weekly World News? No, the Sunday Courier is quite respectable. It ran between 1899 and 1989, and it was basically the Sunday edition of Corriere della Sera, or The Evening Courier, which is still in print. The Evening Courier is one of Italy's oldest newspapers, and it's the most widely read paper in Italy. It's considered one of Italy's newspapers of record, kind of like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Babylon Bee here in America. Um, So it's not a tabloid like the National Enquirer, much less a parody paper like the Weekly World News, where you'd expect to, for example, read stories about Bat Boy's latest escape and adventures. Uh, the Sunday Courier and the Evening Courier was respected, is respected, center-right newspaper, which is not to say that everything in it is accurate, because nobody's news media is always accurate, and especially not Italy's. But when the Evening Courier or the Sunday Courier puts out a story on something, it should not simply be dismissed. Then let's talk about the man who is the alleged inventor of the chronovisor. Who was he, and what can you tell us about him? Well, his name was uh, Father Pellegrino Ernetti. He was born in 1925, and he passed on to his reward in 1994 at the age of 68. He reportedly entered the Benedictine order at age 16, which is quite young, though I gather it was possible, at least back then. And he spent much of his monastic career in the Abbey of San Gregorio Maggiore. Uh, That's St. George Major to you and me. Um, and that's located in Venice, Italy, you know, the place where the streets are made out of water and the taxis are, are gondolas. According to an article by John Chambers in the Fortean Times, A man of unusual brilliance and learning, Father Ernetti, occupied an endowed chair in pre-polyphonic or archaic music, 
music composed between 2000 BC and AD 1200, at Venice's Conservatorio Benedetto Marcello. His scholarly studies of such early pre-polyphonic music had resulted in some 70 books and hundreds of articles. He directed the choir of the Benedictine Abbey of San Giorgio Maggiore, as well as others, and recorded over 50 LPs of Gregorian chant and related music. And his knowledge ranged far beyond the world of archaic music. He held a degree in quantum and subatomic physics and had contributed to significant research in these areas. He was also an exorcist of considerable renown, the most sought after in Italy performing huge numbers of exorcisms at the height of his career and writing a book on the subject, Satan's Catechism, in which he described in detail the symptoms and signs of demonic possession. These achievements, a lifetime's work for most people, would have been remarkable enough, but for Ernetti they were entirely overshadowed by what he considered to be his greatest success, the chronovisor. According to Father Ernetti, work on the device began in the 1950s, and according to one account I've seen, it took 13 years to develop. According to an article by Massimo Polidoro in The Skeptical Inquirer, Ernetti appeared to be very reticent to give details about the machine's invention. It happened virtually by accident. The basic idea was very simple. It was just a matter of stumbling upon it. And who exactly invented it? No one person, replied Ernetti. It had been a joint creation. In fact, it involved a team of 12 other scientists, including ones from Italy, France, and Germany. Father Ernetti said that these individuals preferred to remain anonymous, but he did give the names of two of them since they had already passed away. One was the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. He built the world's first nuclear reactor, he won the Nobel Prize in 1938, and he worked on the Manhattan Project to build the nuclear bomb during World War II. He was so self-assured as a scientist that other physicists nicknamed him the Pope, as if his pronouncements on physics were infallible, which is interesting since Fermi himself was Catholic. And he passed on to his reward in 1954, so 18 years before the chronovisor was announced to the public in 1972. The other individual Ernetti named was German aerospace engineer Werner von Braun. Uh, he had been a member of the Nazi party and the SS, uh, and he had helped the Germans build the V-2 rocket in World War II, so he was a rocket scientist. After the war, he went to work for the Americans, where he helped develop rocket technology for our spaceflight program. Although raised a nominal Lutheran, in 1946, the year after the war ended, he underwent a religious conversion and became an evangelical Christian. At NASA, he was the chief architect of the Saturn V rocket that took us to our sister planet, the Moon. Uh, he is sometimes referred to as the father of space travel and the father of rocket science. And in 1975, he was given the National Medal of Science. He passed on to his reward in 1977, which was after the chronovisor was revealed. So I'm not entirely sure when Father Ernetti revealed his name. If those are the only two members of the team that Father Ernetti named, did he drop any hints about other members? At least a few. Uh, for example, he reportedly said that one of them was from Japan and had, and had won a Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, that would most likely be a reference to Hideki Yukawa, who was a theoretical physicist that won the Nobel Prize in 1949 for predicting the existence of the Pi Mason subatomic particle. There are also others who have been speculated to have been part of the team. In fact, I found a short book that was principally devoted to arguing that the Italian physicist Ettore Majorana was also a member of the team. Ettore Majorana was a really fascinating guy. He was a theoretical physicist who did work on the problem of neutrino masses. He was reportedly brilliant. In fact, Enrico Fermi, the Pope, said that Majorana was as smart as Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton, uh, true giants in the history of science. But Majorana mysteriously vanished in 1938 at age 31. So we may be talking about him and his disappearance in a future episode of Mysterious World. The author of the book I found thinks that he deliberately disappeared and continued to live in hiding, so he would have still been around to help with the chronovisor in the 1950s when Majorana would have been in his 40s. However, all of this is speculation. 
What is the chronovisor itself looks like? And I want to take a moment to explain that the image on our episode art for this week is uh, AI generated. It is not a picture of the actual chronovisor. But what did the chronovisor itself in real life look like? According to Massimo Polidoro, Father Ernetti said the chronovisor consisted of three components. First, a multitude of antenna, which were able to pick up every conceivable wavelength of light and sound. These antenna were made of alloys consisting of three mysterious metals. The second component was a type of direction finder, activated and driven by the wavelengths of light and sound which it received. You could set it to a given place, date, and even person of your choice. The third component was an extremely complex array of recording devices, which made possible the recording of sound, and particularly of images, from any time and any place. Once they had the chronovisor set up and working, they of course wanted to test it and to see whether the images they were receiving by it were historically accurate or not. According to Polidoro, First of all, we wanted to verify that what we saw was authentic, Ernetti told Father Francois Brun, a French theologian and author who had befriended the Italian monk. So we started off with a relatively recent scene of which we had much documentation and footage. We tuned the machine on one of Mussolini's speeches. Benito Mussolini, of course, uh, was known as Il Duce, or the leader. Between 1922 and 1943, he was the prime minister and leader of Italy. Uh, he founded and led the National Fascist Party, and we discussed the fascist movement uh, back in episode 146 on the 1933 business plot, which involved an attempt to stage a coup and impose a fascist government here in America. In 1943, Mussolini fell from power in Italy and was imprisoned, but Hitler jailbroke him and put him in charge of a Nazi puppet state called the Italian Social Republic. In April of 1945, this state was being overrun by the Allies and was on the verge of collapsing, and Italian resistance fighters caught and executed Mussolini, so he passed on to his reward. However, because of his prominence in Italian politics just a few years earlier, there were lots of newsreels of Mussolini speaking, and so it was possible to check the images coming from the chronovisor against the newsreels to see if the images from the chronovisor were accurate. They checked it against a speech that Mussolini gave in Rome, and it turned out that the chronovisor images corresponded to what they saw in the historical record. Afterward, according to Father Ernetti, Then we started to go backward and observe Napoleon giving the speech in which he proclaimed Italy a republic. The French conqueror and Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte had conquered most of Italy in 1799 following the French Revolution, and he proclaimed a new Italian republic. Since it was imposed by a foreign power, the, the French, the Italians weren't wild about it. But since it had happened so recently, just 150 years before the invention of the chronovisor, you could check what the device revealed against the records of Napoleon's historic speech. We then traveled much further back in time to ancient Rome. First, there was a bustling fruit and vegetable market in the time of Emperor Trajan. Next, a speech by Cicero, one of the most famous, the first delivered against Catalina. Ernetti said that he had noticed slight differences in the Latin pronunciation of Cicero's time as compared to the Latin taught in schools today. Cicero was a famous Roman orator, and in 63 BC, he was one of the two consuls of Rome. The consuls were elected to one-year terms, and they were the chief magistrates during the period of the Roman Republic, so they were in charge before Rome became an empire. In 63 BC, Cicero gave a series of speeches against a Roman senator named Lucius Catalina, also known as Catiline. Uh, Cicero accused Catiline of leading a plot to overthrow the Roman Senate, and the speeches he gave against him are one of the most famous events from the Republic. There's even a famous painting of Cicero denouncing Catiline. But more importantly, we have the text of the speeches, so it was possible to check out the chronovisor recording against the historical text, and it also checked out. Though Ernetti did notice some differences in the pronunciation between what Cicero was saying and how Latin is taught today, which is not surprising since there are several different proposals for how to pronounce Latin. In fact, even the name Cicero sometimes gets 
pronounced Kikaro and things like that. According to the book Father Ernetti's Chronovisor by Peter Crassa, Father Ernetti was quite impressed by Cicero's first speech against Catiline. Cicero's speech was magnificent. His gestures, his intonation, how powerful they were. What flights of oratory. That isn't surprising, since Cicero was famed for his oratorical abilities. But after verifying Cicero's speech against the historical record, the chronovisor explorers continued to move backwards in time. Next, the time travelers dallied, as Ernetti put it, at a playlet. The year was 169 BC. They watched part of a tragedy, Thyestes, written by the father of Latin poetry, Quintus Annius. It was a play, explained Ernetti, that is now almost wholly lost to us. Only 25 fragments, a line or so each, have survived. Have you been able to reconstruct what you heard? asked Father Brune. Yes, replied Father Ernetti enthusiastically. Since we heard and saw everything, text, choruses, music, I've been able to publish the entire text of the tragedy. Thyestes is a real play that was written by the Roman playwright Aeneas, and it is, as a whole, lost, though short fragments of it do survive, and I gather they could use those short fragments to validate that the rest of the play that they were seeing was the actual Thyestes. I won't bother summarizing the Greek myth of Thyestes for you, because it's gross and violent. Imagine Oedipus Rex with lashings of cannibalism added. However, I will note that when Christianity began, Romans accused Christians of eating Thyestean banquets because they said that uh, they consumed the body and blood of Jesus, and Romans misunderstood that as actual cannibalism. In any event, they were able to record the entire play that Quintus Ennius wrote, and Father Ernetti was able to subsequently publish it, though it doesn't seem to be available in English. However important recovering a lost work of literature like that was, what really caught the public's attention, and that of the Sunday Courier, was something else. Polidoro explains, On May 2nd, 1972, the weekly Italian magazine, The Sunday Courier, published a picture which Father Ernetti claimed was obtained through the chronovisor. The image showed Christ's face in agony on the cross. At first, explained Father Ernetti to Brune, we tried to recapture the images of the day of Christ's crucifixion, but we had a problem. Crucifixions, as awful as they were, were commonplace in Christ's time. People were nailed to the cross every day. It also didn't help that Christ wore a crown of thorns, because, contrary to popular belief, it wasn't unusual to be punished by having a crown of thorns put on your head. They were thus obliged to go a few days further back in time to the Last Supper of Christ. We saw everything, said Father Ernetti simply. The agony in the garden, the betrayal of Judas, the trial, Calvary. The chronovisor team brought back a record of this experience. We filmed it, losing the fine details, of course, but filming it was the only way to preserve it. And understandably, it was the picture of Christ's face as he was hanging on the cross that really got the attention of both the newspaper editors and the newspaper readers. I mean, who wouldn't be fascinated by what purports to be an actual photograph of Christ and from the time of his passion yet? So this picture features prominently in any story you read about the chronovisor. Unfortunately, the photograph of Christ was the only piece of photographic evidence the team ever released that had been gathered by the chronovisor. Chambers explains, The notorious Christ photo is the only known example of the chronovisor acting as a camera capable of bringing back images or freeze frames from the unfurling vistas of the past to which it gave access. In the years leading up to his death in 1994, Ernetti said less and less about his astonishing creation, leaving little evidence to persuade the doubters, but enough tantalizing hints to ensure the rumors about the time-traveling monk of Venice would continue to circulate in Italy for many years to come. Recently, though, there has been a further turn of the screw with claims of a Vatican cover-up. According to a recent book by a French Jesuit priest, the Vatican not only ordered Ernetti to keep silent about his discovery, but has also, since his death in 1994, suppressed any material evidence of his existence. Father Francois Brune, who knew Ernetti personally and had numerous conversations with him up until Ernetti's death, 
is the author of a number of books on religion and paranormal phenomena, including a bestseller, The Dead Speak to Us. Now in New Mystery of the Vatican, he accuses the Vatican of suppressing Ernetti's temporal research documents and construction plans for the chronovisor. Francois Brun first brought Ernetti's account of the chronovisor before the general public in his 1994 book, Live from the Beyond, written with Remy Chauvin. Brun's familiarity with the story arose from his accidental encounter with Ernetti in 1962, when Brun, then a young Jesuit priest who had just completed graduate work in Rome, was touring the grounds of Venice's Basilica of San Giorgio Maggiore, adjacent to the monastery where Father Ernetti lived. At that first meeting, Ernetti told an astonished Brun about the chronovisor. Afterward, the two met regularly, exchanging ideas on a wide variety of subjects. In 1997, the Viennese journalist Peter Krasa drew heavily on Brun's book to retell Ernetti's story. In Your Fate is Foretold, Krasa added many new details and set the whole against a rich and colorful backdrop of esoteric notions of time travel that included Madame Blavatsky's Akashic Records, Edgar Cayce, and much more. In 2000, New Paradigm Books published an English-language translation of Crass's book with changes and additions. This new American edition was entitled Father Ernetti's Chronovisor, The Creation and Disappearance of the World's First Time Machine. Father Brune's New Mystery of the Vatican is in part a reaction to the New Paradigm version, which included the first translation from Latin of Ernetti's Thyestes fragment. So there have actually been several books written involving the chronovisor and in several different languages, including Father Brune's earlier book, Live from the Beyond, Peter Cross's Your Fate is Foretold, which was republished in modified form in English as Father Ernetti's chronovisor, and Father Brune's more recent book, New Mystery of the Vatican. One of the things that Father Brune says is that the Vatican ordered Father Ernetti to shut up about the chronovisor. And although I don't have an exact quote from him using the term cover-up, I do have stories reporting that Father Brune has accused the Vatican of a cover-up on the subject. For example, Chambers reports, Brune goes on to hint at sinister plots in the darker recesses of the Vatican. Ernetti's eventual lapse into silence on the subject of his magnum opus may have been due to pressures from above, pressures that made it extremely difficult for him to discuss his work, defend himself, as in the case of the Christ photo, or to attend conferences at which he had been due to speak. At their very last meeting, according to Brune, Ernetti told him that one month earlier, on 30 September 1993, he had been invited to the Vatican along with the two surviving scientists of the original chronovisor team. We told them everything, he said. And these were the last words Brune ever heard him say. Even this might not be quite what it seems. If there is a cover-up, Brune feels it is possibly a benevolent one. I retain the very strong impression, he writes, precisely on account of all these maneuvers, that there was, that there truly is, something that the highest authorities are hiding from us, perhaps for the good of humanity given the extent to which such an invention would run the risk of overturning all of our social structures. The potential for the chronovisor to disrupt society is something also discussed by Polidoro, who says, No trace of the chronovisor exists, and Father Ernetti was very careful to explain that after its experimental runs, it had been disassembled and hidden in a safe place. But why hide such a discovery, Father Brun asked. Father Ernetti replied, this machine can tune in on everyone's past completely, leaving nothing out. With it, there can be no more secrets, no more state secrets, no more industrial secrets, no more private lives. The door would be wide open for the most fearsome dictatorship the world has ever seen. We ended up agreeing to dismantle our machine. And you can see how people could regard the chronovisor as dangerous. If it's true that you could tune in to any place on Earth at any time in history, then you could find out about anything. You could learn any secret. Government secrets, military secrets, business secrets, personal secrets. And you could use those to thwart other people's plans. For example, you could use government, military, and business secrets to outmaneuver people and beat them in competitions, including wars. 
You could use personal secrets to blackmail people and bend them to your will. They wouldn't even have to be secrets involving crime or criminality. We've all made mistakes in life, and well, some things are just personal. Um, we all have moments that we wouldn't want others recording and then broadcasting to the world, even moments that have nothing to do with sin or mistakes. So you can see how extensive the potential for blackmail and extortion would be. Every new technology that gets developed is disruptive of the current order of things in one way or another, and the chronovisor could be extremely disruptive for society, so it could be understandable that the decision could be made to keep the device under wraps. As Chambers states, Father Ernetti reveals that there is only one person living who knows the full details of the device, someone who had helped him build it. A student not known to history, he is a priest now, and he will remain very silent. So that's where we stand today with respect to the chronovisor, and with that as background, we can now turn to the faith and reason perspectives. But before we do that, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Thomas F., Luke D., John K., Susan B., and Isaac L. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. And by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the chronovisor that we should look at? Well, basically, there are two. Either the story is substantially true, that a device like this really was built, or the story is false, that no such device existed. Those are our two basic options. All right, so what can we say about the chronovisor from the faith perspective? Well, there's nothing contrary to the faith in the idea of viewing the past. In fact, from his perspective in the eternal now outside of time, God constantly views all of history at once, including the past. If someone actually built a chronovisor, there would be moral concerns about how it got used, as we mentioned before the break. But the idea of viewing the past is not intrinsically sinful. It's what you choose to do with the information that you acquire by viewing it that would be problematic. All right, then what can we say about the chronovisor from the reason perspective? Where do you want to begin? I want to begin by verifying that Father Ernetti existed. Uh, there are lots of wild stories out there, and when you look into them, it sometimes turns out that the key players in the story never existed, or at least that there's no evidence of them existing. So I want to begin by seeing if Father Ernetti was even real. How would you go about doing that? By looking for evidence of him in different places. Uh, one place that you might look is Wikipedia, and Father Ernetti does have a Wikipedia page, which we'll have a link to. Of course, you can't take Wikipedia pages at face value because anyone can edit Wikipedia. So even if the story of the chronovisor was complete bunk, someone could make up a Wikipedia page for Father Ernetti. They might do so with malicious or comic intent, knowing that it's a hoax. Or they might do so innocently. For example, they might read Father Brune's book or Peter Cross's book and write a Wikipedia article on about him on that basis. Nevertheless, a Wikipedia article might contain links to other sources that could be used to verify his existence. Unfortunately, it doesn't. The article on him at the time of recording is just a stub, and it cites only one source, the English version of Peter Cross's book. So it looks like the article is based exclusively on that source. So what other ways would there be of verifying his existence? One way is seeing if there are quotations from people who knew him and can thus effectively testify to his existence. One such person would be Father Brune, who wrote two books about him. 
Uh, Father Brune reports meeting him and having conversations with him, as we already heard. However, Father Brune is just one guy, and yes, he's a priest, but there are crazy priests and bad priests, so Father Brune could have made up the figure of Father Ernetti. Did you find anyone else who could confirm Father Ernetti's existence? Yes, uh, the Fortean Times article on the Chronovisor contained an interview with Peter Krasa. In that interview, we read this exchange. Interviewer, did you ever meet Ernetti in person? Peter Krasa. In the early 1990s, I corresponded with Ernetti, but his answers were rather vague. I did not know then that the Vatican had already ordered him to keep silent because his earlier public statements came close to arousing the interest of the espionage community. So even though he apparently didn't meet him in person, Krasa says he did correspond with Father Ernetti, which would be additional evidence supporting his existence if the two men exchanged letters. Also, I'd note that there is some tension between Father Brune and Peter Krasa. In his book on the Chronovisor, Krasa included a number of critical arguments, and part of what Father Brune's second book did was respond to these arguments, to defend against them. So we have two men who disagree with and critique each other, both agreeing that Father Ernetti existed. So that's significant, significant evidence that he did exist. But Peter Cross had never met him in person. If this was all a hoax, couldn't the letters he received from Ernetti have been written by someone else? Yes, they could have, but even meeting him in person wouldn't prove that he really existed. In a truly elaborate hoax, someone else could have pretended to be Father Ernetti. He could have been an actor. So unless you know someone intimately, you can never 100% rule out the possibility of a hoax. That's one reason that I don't take the pictures of Father Ernetti that are on the internet as proof. I found a number of such photographs. However, as we saw in episode 269 on Paul Amadeus Dinach, the man who allegedly saw the year AD 3906, Pictures you find on the internet aren't always reliable. All kinds of websites have a photograph of a man that is supposed to be Paul Dienach. We even used it in our artwork for that episode. However, as we pointed out, if you check it out, it turns out that the photograph is not Paul Dienach. Instead, it's a, uh, it's a photo of a criminal from New Zealand named Daniel Towhill, as we discussed in the episode, and there is no good evidence that Paul Dienach even existed. So we can't trust photographs from the internet as a way of establishing someone's identity. A photograph in a newspaper would be different, and the photographs in the Fortean Times, a magazine, have some value in my mind. I actually did find what appears to be a picture of Father Annetti in the Italian newspaper, The Sunday Courier, but the resolution of the photograph wasn't good enough for me to read the caption and make sure that it was Father Ernetti. so I still wanted more proof that he really existed. Were you able to find something that satisfied you? Yes. One of the things that the articles about him mention is that Father Ernetti published a lot, for example, on sacred music. Uh, most of his articles probably wouldn't be that easy to find. They'd likely be in obscure Italian academic journals that may not even be on the web. And he lived long enough ago that most of his books, which would be in Italian, are probably out of print. But Father Ernetti was also reportedly a well-known exorcist, and he reportedly wrote a book about demons called The Catechesis of Satan, or in Italian, La Catechesi di Satana. Well, it turns out that's a real book. I found images of it, and it has Father Ernetti's name right on the cover. Hypothetically, the book itself could be a hoax. However, the odds of a publisher printing a book on a topic like this from an author who doesn't exist is quite low. So I concluded I had reasonable evidence that Father Ernetti existed. Later, I found more evidence. I found an interview with the Italian exorcist Father Gabriel Amorth in the magazine 30 Days, where he talks about meeting Father Ernetti. And he says that Father Ernetti was, quote, a famous exorcist from Venice, close quote. So that was more evidence. If Father Ernetti existed, what evidence would we have that could shed light on whether the story of the chronovisor is true? 
Some people might be inclined to look at the fact that he was both a priest and an exorcist as evidence of his truthfulness about the chronovisor, and those facts could provide support in favor of, of a presumption of truthfulness, but they aren't conclusive. As we've all learned in the last 20 years, there are some priests, a fairly small number, who just can't be trusted. And the same thing is true of exorcists. Uh, recent years have seen a number of exorcists who fell from ministry hard or who are crazy or otherwise untrustworthy, as we saw in episode 123 on Father Michel Rodrigue. So we can't trust him just because he was a priest and an exorcist. Is there anything objective we could point to that could support the story of the chronovisor? One thing is the script that he was reportedly able to publish of the play Theestes by the Latin author Quintus Ennius. Uh, when it comes to this one, there is some controversy about whether or not it could be authentic. According to Polidoro, Actually, this one, after close scrutiny by Catherine Owen Eldred, who holds a PhD in classics from Princeton University, provides reasons to doubt. For one thing, a number of words in the text do not appear in the Latin language, until at least 250 years later than the time of Ennius. Also, says Eldred, there are certain words which are reused in this text too often, clear sign of a limited Latin vocabulary, which was certainly not the case with author Quinto Ennio. Furthermore, of the 24 fragments of Ennio's Thyestes, which have been preserved for us by later commentators, such as Cicero, Nonius, and Stadius, more than half show up in the Ernetti Thyestes piece. Since the Ernetti Thyestes playlet is only one-tenth the probable length of the complete tragedy by Ennius, it might have been expected that, on the average, about 10% of the fragments would show up. Here, 65% of the fragments show up, about seven times as many as you might reasonably expect. However, there's another side to this issue. Chambers reports, The translation was made by Dr. Catherine Owen Eldred of Princeton, who tentatively suggests, on the basis of internal linguistic evidence, that the passage provided by Ernetti is a fraud, carefully pieced together from other texts by Ernetti, who was himself a noted Latinist. In his book, Father Francois Brun, also an excellent Latinist, responds vigorously to this muted allegation. He points out a number of errors in Dr. Eldred's translation, which, though minor in nature, do serve, as is Father Brun's intention, to undercut Dr. Eldred's authority and cast doubt on her hypothesis of fraud. So we have different Latinists disagreeing about whether the text of Thyestes that Ernetti copied from the chronovisor is a hoax or not. Dr. Eldred said that she found problems in the text that would point to fraud, but Father Brun disputed this. Ultimately, I don't think that the Thyestes transcript would have been a very persuasive piece of evidence in the first place. Uh, the reason is that the text does not display what in paranormal investigations is called vertical knowledge. That is, it doesn't contain information that is not presently known to be true that later turns out to be true. Yes, Father Ernetti's portion of the play contains quotations or fragments from the original play that have survived, but these were already known, which means that a classicist like Father Ernetti could have looked up the fragments and then written the rest of the script to incorporate them. So that doesn't offer us any proof that the script is real. What would offer such proof is if he produced a script and then a new fragment of Thyestes was discovered, one that nobody knew about before. And if that new fragment turned out to have also been in what he transcribed, that would give us evidence for authenticity. But that's not what happened. So the script fragment really doesn't give us evidence that the chronovisor was real. What about the photograph of Jesus suffering on the cross that the Sunday Courier printed? Does that provide evidence that the device was real? Well, here again, we encounter another issue. Supposedly, the Chronovisor team had captured motion picture images from the end of Christ's life on film. But, as Polidoro reports, No trace of this film, however, ever came to light. The only objective proof that came out of this story was that picture. A few months after its publication, however, the mystery was solved. In the August 1972 issue of the Italian Journal of Mysteries, a letter and a photo were published. 
A reader, Alfonso de Silva, explained that he had purchased the photo for 100 lira in the gift shop of the Santuario del Amore Miscricorioso, that is, the Sanctuary of Merciful Love, in the town of Calavalenza near Todi and Perugia. It was a photograph of the face of Christ on a wood carving adorning the sanctuary. The wood carving was by a Spanish sculptor named Calat Valera. This photo and the one produced by Father Ernetti were identical, except that one was the mirror image of the other. No one could deny that they were identical, not even Father Brune, who, when the monk had less than a year to live, asked his friend about this compromising photo. Now, Polidoro says that nobody could deny that the two images were identical, with what De Silva found on the postcard just being a left-right reversal of the image that Father Ernetti allegedly got from the chronovisor. But this isn't accurate. I'll deny that they are identical. If you're watching the video version of the podcast, we'll have an image of the two pictures side by side. And yes, they do look similar. Yes, one has Jesus looking to the left and the other has him looking to the right. But the one published by the Sunday Courier clearly is not just a mirror image reversal of the one from the postcard. The courier image is more close up than the postcard image. It's taken from a different angle, and the shadows on Jesus's face are different. So while they do look similar, it isn't the case that one is just the mirror image of the other. Also, there are subtle differences in the image in the two images, like the crest of Jesus's nose and the shading around his eyes that make me at least suspect they might not be the same thing. Incidentally, I also found other wider field images of the crucifix in its native setting in the Sanctuary of Merciful Love, but I didn't find any that appeared to be a mirror image of the courier photograph. Still, the photograph that Ernetti published had now been challenged. How did he respond? Uh, in more than one way. Uh, first, Chambers reports. During his lifetime, Ernetti had given conflicting accounts of his time viewer, even claiming that the notorious photo of Christ's agony on the cross was actually of his own face while he was watching Christ's crucifixion via the chronovisor. I don't know if Ernetti really said that, but if he did, it strikes me as very implausible. Uh, sure, Ernetti could have been photographed while watching the crucifixion on the chronovisor, and sure, the Sunday Courier could have gotten mixed up and thought that it was an image of Christ when it was really an image of Ernetti. Except for the fact that Ernetti looks nothing like the man in the supposed photo of Christ, so this doesn't look like a newspaper mix-up. Later, Ernetti had another explanation. You'll recall that Polidoro reported that Father Brune had asked Father Ernetti about the photo the year before he died, which would have been 1993. Well, Polidoro continues. Ernetti's reply was very disingenuous. He explained that he was aware of the other photo, aware that it was the work of a Spanish sculptor. He also said he knew that the Spanish sculptor had carved his Christ according to the instruction of a certain Spanish nun that this Spanish nun had been a mystic who carried the stigmata of Christ on her body and was consumed by ecstatic visions of Christ's passion. Ernetti seemed to have assumed that Father Brune would understand the rest. The Parisian priest does not dwell on this in his article. But Peter Crassa, author of Father Ernetti's chronovisor, does and assumes that Father Ernetti is tendering the following explanation. The ecstatic vision of Christ's passion, which the mystical nun had enjoyed, was a vision of Christ dying on the cross on Golgotha. This was the vision she had communicated to the Spanish sculptor. Following her instructions, he had sculpted on the face of the Christ on the wooden cross the exact features, the very expression of Christ, that she had seen in her vision. The fact that not only were the pictures identical in their subject, but also in the shadows and light reflections, means that the two images were in fact the same picture. I find this explanation extremely implausible. Uh, first, if a Spanish nun had visions of Christ on the cross, it's quite unlikely that they were photorealistic of what the actual crucifixion would have looked like. In his classic work, Teaching on the Beatification of Servants of God and the Canonization of Blesseds, uh, published in English as Heroic Virtue, the future Pope Benedict XIV 
Cardinal uh, Prospero Lambertini, discussed this kind of issue. There had been a controversy back in his day about whether Christ was crucified with three or four nails, with some mystics seeing visions of the crucifixion where Christ was pierced by three nails and other mystics seeing him pierced by four. So there was a controversy about which mystics were right. And the future Benedict XIV said that we shouldn't look to visions for details like this. The point that God is trying to make by giving such visions is not to teach us how many nails Christ was crucified with, but to give us a vivid portrait of his suffering to help us appreciate him more and draw closer to him spiritually. We thus shouldn't look to such visions for historical details. But if we shouldn't look to such visions for big obvious details like the number of nails, then we also shouldn't look at them for small level details like exact facial features. So I think that any such visions received by a Spanish nun would not be likely to be photorealistic of the actual historical crucifixion. And second, even if what she saw was photorealistic, it's extraordinarily unlikely that the nun would be able to give instructions sufficient to allow a sculptor to produce a wood carving that exactly matched what she saw in her mind. Um, you know, you just look at at um, at illustrations made by uh, police artists based on witness descriptions of what criminals look like. They never look exactly right. Um, and the same thing would apply here. Visionaries, in fact, often have trouble communicating what they saw to artists. Reportedly, uh, St. Faustina Kowalska was never happy with the divine mercy images that were made and said that they didn't adequately correspond to what she had seen Jesus looking like. So I think it's very unlikely that an exact down-to-the-fine-details portrait of the actual crucifixion would end up on a wood carving and that this would correspond to an actual image of the crucifixion from the chronovisor. So what do you personally make of the image Father Ernetti published? Well, it's a dramatic image, but I don't think it gives us any kind of evidence that the chronovisor was real. Uh, as we've just seen, there are numerous images of the crucifixion. People make them all the time, sometimes with paint, sometimes with wood carving, and sometimes by photographing actors playing Jesus Christ. Having an image of Christ's suffering face doesn't remotely establish that it's a real image captured by a time machine. And even if it's an image of an actual human rather than a painting or a carving, it could still just be an actor or model playing Jesus. But in this case, there's another problem, which is that the face of the image in the Sunday Courier just does not look like a real person. If you look at the brow line, especially the brow over Jesus' left eye, which is in the right side of the image, it is much too sharp. It looks like a line carved in wood, not an actual human brow. And if you look at his eyes, they are absolutely ginormous and much too large. I thus think that it's possible that this is a photograph of the crucifix from the Sanctuary of Merciful Love taken from a different angle than the image on the postcard. But I think it's certain that it is not a picture of a real human, and thus not a real picture of Jesus on the cross. That would make it sound like the chronovisor was just a hoax then. Did any confirmation of that ever emerge? Well, Polidoro had this to say. Near the end of the chronovisor saga, as in a classic mystery tale, comes an unexpected surprise, a confession. In his book, Crossa reproduced a letter from an unidentified distant relative of Father Ernetti who claimed he had met him on his deathbed. Ernetti wished to leave this world with a clear conscience, and so he admitted that he had not really brought that play, Thyestes, back on the chronovisor. He said that he thought he had composed the play himself, using many fragments that were preserved in the writings of other authors, but he could only very obscurely remember doing that. However, before taking this as a true confession, one must know that a few sentences later, Father Ernetti tells about another lifetime in which he was a contemporary of Nostradamus. 
I knew him, he said. He was an alchemist and a physicist. He too experimented with a chronovisor. It was he who taught me that it might be possible. Another account of this is provided uh, by John Chambers, who was the publisher of New Paradigm Books, which released Peter Cross's book in English. He says, There is more in the New Paradigm edition to try the patience of Father Brune. The final chapter consists of a hitherto unpublished deathbed confession, sent anonymously to me as the publisher by a person claiming to be a distant relative of Vernetti who attended his deathbed, that, although he was continually working on the chronovisor, he had never perfected it and had never traveled with it through time. This strange and gripping document also purports to explain the psychological roots of Ernetti's obsession with Thyestes. Ernetti said he remembered living in ancient Rome as a boy, attending a performance of Ennius's play and being fascinated by its portrayal of cannibalism. I cannot say for certain whether this confession is authentic, but I have, after some investigation, reason to believe that it is. In New Mystery of the Vatican, Brune examines his confession closely, for it seems to contradict his basic assertion that Ernetti was telling the truth. He points out, quite rightly, a number of errors and contradictions in it. For instance, there would have been no nuns expressly mentioned by the supposed relative in the monastery of San Giorgio Maggiore, even if they were serving as nurses to Ernetti. In the confession, Ernetti says that it was only during a near-death experience, an NDE, the previous night that he remembered obscurely that it was not Quintus Ennius, but himself, who had composed the fragment of Thyestes that he claimed to have brought back from the past. Brune wonders how Ernetti, if he had committed this fraud, could have so completely, even pathologically, put it out of his mind only to remember it obscurely in the throes of an NDE. Again, the chronovisor described by the dying Ernetti is quite unlike the device he had previously described to Brune and others, a sphere much like a diving device, or one-man submarine, open at eye level in all directions. Brune writes, it is like something someone would imagine who had never heard Father Ernetti talk about it. It seems to me the author of the document has read a little bit too much science fiction. Perhaps there is a certain influence from the comic strips. However, the deathbed account also contains some fascinating original detail. Ernetti reveals to the relative that during his NDE of the night before, he learned that he had tried to build the chronovisor in a number of previous lifetimes. In one, Nostradamus himself taught him that such a device might be possible. Ernetti is quoted as saying, Nostradamus believed it could be done by changing the vaporous body, that the body could be transformed in such a way that it could easily slip through time. Ernetti then swears that he will reincarnate once again to try to complete the chronovisor. Father Brune concludes that despite the sincerity of the editors of New Paradigm Books, who admit that they don't know for sure, the deathbed confession is a fraud. It fails to change his conviction that the chronovisor actually existed. On the contrary, he believes that the confession is proof that someone has a rather serious interest in discrediting Father Ernetti's claims. It is a red herring, he says, meant to deflect us from the truth and to mask the suppression of all information concerning the chronovisor. So Brune doesn't think that the deathbed confession is real. What do you think about it? I actually don't put a lot of weight in the alleged deathbed confession. In the first place, we don't know who this supposed relative was. Anybody could forge a letter and send it in claiming to be a relative who heard Ernetti's deathbed admission of fraud. And I don't know what, if anything, Crassa or Chambers did to verify that the person behind the letter was who he claimed to be. Also, there are inconsistencies that Father Brune identified between what Father Ernetti claimed on other occasions and what the deathbed confession said, like the machine physically looking different. Uh, then there's all this stuff about Ernetti having lived past lives in ancient Rome and with Nostradamus, who we discussed in episode 153, and then again the next week in episode 154. And Ernetti vowed that he would return in a future life to continue work on the chronovisor? Well, needless to say, reincarnation is contrary to Catholic teaching. And while there are some Catholics who believe it, despite what the New Testament teaches, it's somewhat unlikely that a man who was a Catholic monk, a Catholic priest, and a Catholic exorcist would believe in reincarnation. 
not impossible, especially in the confusion after Vatican II, but not probable. So there's enough reason for doubt here that I don't think we can say with any certainty that the deathbed confession was real. Even if the deathbed confession was a fake, it's not looking good for the chronovisor. Did Father Brune acknowledge that there were problems with Father Ernetti's story? Yes, but he also thought that Father Ernetti was telling the truth to a significant degree. Uh, Chambers states, Father Brune cannot accept that Father Ernetti might not, in the main, be telling the truth about the chronovisor. He points to Ernetti's enormous scholarly output to support his belief. Brune insists on his subject's respectability and authority in the face of mounting confusion about Ernetti's obsession with the chronovisor, and is unable to completely dismiss Ernetti's assertions. Not only is he overawed by Ernetti's great learning and productivity as a scientist and a scholar, he is convinced of Ernetti's high personal integrity, which he was able to observe closely in the course of many conversations. While aware of the fantastic nature of Ernetti's claim and the huge implications if it is true, the French Jesuit remains unable to see how a man as learned and respected as Ernetti could have been driven, possibly by some uncontrollable mythomania, to fabricate and lie, or at least to delude himself. And even though Peter Cross's book was more critical of Ernetti, he also thought that Ernetti was fundamentally honest. In the interview with him that the Fortean Times published, he says, Crassa, I'm still convinced of Ernetti's honesty, even in the light of all the inconsistencies in his story. Interviewer, what makes you believe he was telling the truth? Crassa, as a theologian, he could not really expect any personal gain from a hoax, and also he could not seriously hope to make a financial profit. Obviously, the chronovisor itself would be the best evidence for his claims. But shortly before he died from cancer, Ernetti had the machine disassembled and ordered the single parts to be sent to different locations over the world. Interviewer. But it would certainly imply that he was unbalanced. Perhaps visions or ideas that were un incompatible with his scientific education haunted him. The chronovisor might be a symbol of scientific reasoning, a self-delusional mental construct. Krasa. No, I don't think that Father Ernetti was mentally ill. Nor do I believe that his account of the chronovisor is purely metaphorical. Just recently, I read a newspaper article in which Professor Giuseppe Marasca, the teacher who claims to have seen Father Ernetti's recording, of the lost Roman opera Thyestes, says he still possesses this most spectacular videotape. I can hardly be a judge of Vernetti's character, as I never met him in person. Still, from description by others, I assume he was a very charming man, even if he had moments where he was rather egocentric. Nor must we forget that he was a top-notch scientist and renowned academic, an expert on archaic music who had studied nuclear physics. He was also Italy's most sought-after exorcist and one of the pioneer researchers in the field of electronic voice phenomena. Electronic voice phenomena, or EVP, involves the use of electronic devices that reportedly capture the voices of ghosts saying things, and we'll talk about it in a future episode. I find it interesting that Krasa says someone had a copy of a videotape from the chronovisor of the play Theestes, but this doesn't move the needle much for me, since the newspaper article could have been inaccurate. You know, there are many tabloid-style newspapers in Italy that aren't very reliable, and the videotape has never emerged, so it may be a hoax too. Still, the people who knew Ernetti thought he was sincere. Do you think that there's any possibility that the chronovisor was real? I find it very difficult to believe this. Uh, in the first place, mainstream physics doesn't have any idea how to build something like the chronovisor. We're not even close to being able to do so. And if we aren't close to being able to do that today, it's scarcely likely that they would have been successfully doing it more than 50 years ago in 1972 or even 70 years ago in the 1950s. Further, scientific advances don't come out of nowhere. Even if they end up classified, there is always preliminary research that gets published before a device gets built. Then the authorities take notice of the preliminary research and offer funding for doing classified work on the idea. And it's that latter work that gets classified, 
But the preliminary research is out there in public view, such as in academic journals. And as far as I know, there is no preliminary research handing at something like the chronovisor in the mid-20th century. There's even the fact that if we were able to build a chronovisor in the mid-20th century, well, then it'd have to be a pretty simple thing to do. Uh, because we didn't have the kind of tech back then that we do now. It would have to be something you could do that does not require the technology we have now. But if that were the case, then other people should have independently figured out how to make their own chronovisors, and we don't seem to have evidence of that happening. Finally, there's a scientific issue here. To be able to capture sights and sounds from the past, you would either need to be able to tune in to the exact place in the universe, you know, the exact spot in space and time where they happened, or these sights and sounds would have to be recorded on some kind of physical medium, like an unknown layer of reality or something. It would not be possible to reconstruct past sights and sounds by tracing backwards the path of light and sound waves today. The number of variables and the raw computing power needed to do calculations like that would make it absolutely impossible. So the sights and sounds would have to be recorded somewhere that the chronovisor could physically access. And we don't have any idea what such a physically accessible layer of reality would be. On the other hand, if you're tuning in to the exact location in space and time of the events, well, there's another problem. The Earth is moving. In fact, the solar system itself is moving through space at a speed of 124 miles per second. So if you wanted to, just around the core of the galaxy. So if you wanted to view the crucifixion of Christ 2,000 years ago, you would need to look at an event that occurred 7.8 trillion miles away. That's 1.3 light years from the Earth's present location. So how's that supposed to work? If you're tuning in to the exact location in space and time, you're going to need a physically enormous and enormously precise tuning device with a huge range. Or unless there's an unknown medium recording the data that travels along with the solar system, events in the distant past shouldn't be accessible. Even in the course of a single year, we end up 196 million miles away from where we were six months ago as we orbit the sun. So the memory medium would need to travel with the Earth itself. But this doesn't behave like anything known in physics, an information storage medium that's not made of normal matter, yet travels along with the planet that is made out of normal matter. So I find the, and, and this is a physically accessible uh, medium because you can use a physical device like a chronovisor to, to access it. So I find the concept of the chronovisor and especially the idea that we could build one in the mid 20th century very implausible. Then what's your opinion of Father Ernetti? Why would he make up such a story? What's your bottom line on the chronovisor? I don't know what to make of Father and Eddie. In part, that's because I have limited resources about him at present. I, I know he was real. I know he was an exorcist. And I know a few biographical facts about his life. But the story he told is highly scientifically and technologically implausible. And the alleged material he retrieved from the chronovisor, like the script of Thyestes and the photograph of Christ, is all shot through with problems. Uh, the script has problems and is very questionable, and the photograph of Christ isn't a photograph of a real human being, yet Father Ernetti published it as if that's what it was. So, I don't know why he said what he did. I don't know if he was pulling a deliberate hoax or if he was mentally ill and sincerely believed that he had built a chronovisor, but I do know that his story isn't believable. Not to me, anyway. And that's my bottom line. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listener and viewer? 
Well, we'll have a link to uh, Massimo Colangelo's book On the Tracks of Ettore Majorana and the Chronovisor. Also, the article from the Fortean Times that we've been discussing, the one from the Skeptical Inquirer, uh, the Stubb article on uh, Pellegrino Renetti on Wikipedia, also information about Francois Brune, uh, the Father Gabriel Amorth article from 30 Days, uh, an article on St. Faustina's unhappiness with the Divine Mercy images, and information about how fast the Earth is moving. Very good. And now it's time to hear from you. What are your theories about Father Ernetti and his amazing chronovisor? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619 738 Four five one five. That's six one nine seven three eight four five one five. And I want to say a special thanks to Oasis Studio Seven for the video and animation work they did on this episode. You can check out their work by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. It really adds to the experience of the audio version of the podcast to have video along with it. And while you're there, you can help me grow my channel. If you like the video or comment on the video or subscribe to the channel, that tells YouTube that you found the video engaging and that other people might find it engaging too. So just by it, and it'll show it to more people. So just by liking, commenting and subscribing, you can help get the video out to more people. And when you subscribe, be sure and hit the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video out and whether it's Mysterious World or one of the other videos I now put out regularly. So Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week is the 300th episode of Mysterious World. At least it's the 300th one in our regular numbering series, besides the bonus episodes we also put out. So because it's episode 300, we're going to be celebrating by hearing more of the mysterious experiences that listeners have sent in. And I'll be giving you my thoughts on them and what might explain them. So you won't want to miss that. Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 299. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at RosaryArmy.com and SchoolOfMary.com. And by... Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.